we've submitted our plans and we should know by July 1st. And it's, again, as soon as we know, we will share that out um, to you as soon as possible. Uh, we are working with the Maine University on re-entry plans and we'll communicate those specific details as soon as possible. For now, uh, be sure to save the dates for August 19th through 21st for our virtual orientation. We will all share, also share out information about the convocation ceremony and the rabies clinic. Um, without further ado, I will let Dr. Engler and Dr. Leith take it from here. Dr. Leith, take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, Denise. It's really great to see everybody here. Um, I know that we've all been probably anxiously awaiting the start of school as much as you guys. And um, every day we have you in mind as we work through the curriculum and build our courses. And I'm just was so happy to be able to have the opportunity to share with you what we're developing so that you can get a chance to um, see what our courses are going to look like uh, in clinical and professional skills. And then uh, my colleague will share with you uh, more about the large animal perspective. Um, so, Mindy, you're welcome to share the PowerPoint. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Um, so, we can advance to the next slide if that's all right. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to begin uh, talking a little bit about who I am and where I came from. Uh, and then when you guys arrive in uh, the summer, um, I would love to hear the same about you. Um, I'm originally from Maryland. Um, I grew up right in Baltimore County. Um, that's why I have the Baltimore Oriole there. That is our state bird. I, the bird is a lot more pretty and successful than our baseball team. So for those of you who um, like sports, the sports uh, perspective is much better here in Arizona than in Maryland. Um, I was one of those students that always wanted to be a veterinarian. I was, I was kind of your classic cat and dog vet. Um, that, that's what I grew up dreaming and wanting to do. Um, because I was on the East Coast, I focused primarily on um, schools in the East Coast area. And I had the opportunity to attend Cornell University, both for my undergrad experience and also for uh, my, my graduate veterinary degree. Um, and it was there that, that I really thrived in the, the canine and feline medicine. Uh, and when I graduated there um, in 2008, I decided to follow my dream and I went straight into private practice where I was an associate veterinarian. Um, I practiced um, in Maryland and then I practiced as well in upstate New York. And I was a full-time associate veterinarian until about 2014. At that point, I had the opportunity to go back to Cornell. Um, I worked on my day off once a week um, to really help students in their third and fourth year move through the clinical rotations in a, a service called CPS, Community Practice Service. So it was the one rotation in the hospital that really mirrored um, small animal practice. And I had the chance to work with students, uh, much like yourselves, and it was there that I said, you know, I really love this environment. I love that students are constantly lifelong learners. And, and I realized I had a lot to learn and grow myself. And that was really what, what sparked my interest in teaching. Um, from there, I had the opportunity to join Midwestern University and I was founding faculty there from 2014 when they opened their doors to their inaugural class to 2017. Um, in 2017, I moved to Kansas to build the clinical skills curriculum that is currently implemented now. Um, and then I'm very, very excited to come back home. I know it's not my literal home, but it's becoming that every day. Uh, I moved back here in February. And so I've been working to build the curriculum for you all here. Um, so Mindy, we can go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, my main interest is, is primary care and trying to train you to have day one ready skills. And what does that mean? There's a lot of different things that that could mean. Um, on paper. For me, I always try to think about what will facilitate your education, what's going to make you the most successful. And so in addition to teaching, I absolutely love to write. And so um, I write textbooks that are aimed to help you uh, be successful in your journey. Um, the best news of all is they're all going to be available to you on, in terms of the physical exam skills and common clinical presentations through our, our university library. So you're not required to purchase any of them, but, but they have come with about a thousand color pictures that I hope will help you. Um, and, and really the concept there is if we can 
give you a taste of what clinical practice is like. Um, that may help you to see the diseases that you're learning about in anatomy um, and all of those other core courses. We can go to the next slide, Mindy. When I'm not teaching or writing, this is my baby. So Bailey, um, Bailey is 16. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Tonkinese cats, but um, she was my very first Tonkinese rescue. Um, I can't believe she's been with me almost half, well, actually uh, half, more than half of my life. Um, I named her after the dessert, Bailey's Creme Brulee. I like to joke about her intellectual capacity, so that's why I say she, she was gonna pursue astrophysics, but she decided to live with me instead. <laughs> Uh, the truth is she was a, a reject show kitty um, that had the face and demeanor um, to excel other than the fact that she liked to hide under chairs the first couple months of her life. So that didn't really make her a good show cat. So she came home with me. Um, like me, she's from Maryland and then she's traveled with me all over the country. And so um, she's been with me to New York and Arizona the first time and Kansas and now here. So I say that the house I'm in now is her retirement home and her villa. So um, she kind of does what she wants and I'm here to uh, take care of her. Um, she does do tricks from time to time. I don't know if she'll do one now, but she kind of does a high five. So that's her great skill. You know, she could get an Olympic medal for that. Um, and she's a, she's a good girl. So you'll see her a lot and creep up in different case reports and things that we do. Okay, Mindy, next slide. I think it's important uh, that all of us have a life outside of vet school. That's not something that honestly I ever thought about when I myself was in your shoes. Um, education was a lot different back then. It was sort of the sink or swim mentality and you went to school and you worked hard and you were up 24 hours a day, seven days a week sometimes. And there really wasn't any thought on well-being um, and keeping yourself well-rounded. Uh, and that I think was unfortunate and it really was not until uh, many years out in practice that I discovered as proud as I was to be a veterinarian and still am, it's really critical that we have an outside life, something to, to make us excited about. And um, whether that's, you know, sports or going for a walk or listening to music or painting, we all have our own kind of niche. For me, it's ballroom dancing. So if anybody loves dance, I'm always happy to, to share my dream with you. Um, when I'm not teaching, I compete on the weekends. Um, nationally um, and so I've had a lot of great experiences there. Uh, for me it, it just powers me through and gives me the energy and excitement to uh, come to school every day and teach. Next slide Mindy. So that's a bit about me. Um, I really want to give you an opportunity to, to hear about what our courses are going to be like and all of us as faculty are counting down until you arrive. Uh, myself especially because I'm in the unique position where I really get to teach not just one course, but two, um, clinical skills and professional skills. I'll lead those courses. I'll have a lot of faculty helping out with me. Um, but what's great about those courses is they don't end after fall semester year one. They continue through every subsequent semester. And so while I'm planning for fall year one, I'm also planning for spring and summer and then year two of fall semester. And that's where you see the, the layering effect of these four courses. So we're going to take a look at what, what that actually means. We'd love to, to start by putting a foundation together. And the first six weeks of your curriculum uh, is titled Foundations. Um, you'll be learning a lot of other four course material. Um, we're going to pour the foundation of clinical knowledge as well. Um, the idea being we start with knowledge and then layer. We build and build and build so that by the time you get to your spring of second year when you're involved in sophomore surgery and you're gearing up for selectives and you're gearing up for life beyond, you know, in your three clinical rotations, you're going to feel really comfortable, you're going to feel confident, and you're going to feel like you can adapt to the situations that are, that are tossed your way. So what kind of knowledge do we need to know? And honestly, if I asked each one of you, you could probably provide a much better list, a much more thorough list than I provided here. I just wanted to bullet a couple of items um, just as a reminder of what kinds of things we're going to cover over the first two years of your preclinical curriculum in clinical skills. We start basic sometimes. We're gonna start in your first week with observation skills. What am I actually looking at when I'm looking at my patient? whether that's a cat, a dog, a sheep, a horse, 
Um, those are the four species we're gonna focus on in the fall. We're gonna add in cattle in the spring um, as we're building out Campbell Farms and expanding upon our collection of teaching animals. We're gonna also talk about physical exam skills and that's a, a skill we're gonna start within the first six weeks of the curriculum. And we're going to build that so that as you're learning, say, about the heart and the lungs and the kidneys, you can actually examine cats and dogs and horses and sheep and say, what can I gather in terms of information and data by looking and putting my hands on those animals? In the fall, we're also going to work on venipuncture, um, drawing blood. Uh, we're going to migrate up and work our way towards intravenous catheterization. As you move towards sophomore surgery, we're going to focus a lot on anesthesia machines. What does that look like? How do we troubleshoot them? How do we put them together? And how do we actually intubate our patients to make for a successful recovery? So that pours that first layer, that first foundation. These are again just some examples of basic veterinary knowledge that we're going to cover. We have to think about what's normal for our patients and that's what year one fall is really about, even actually spring and summer too. What do we expect to see? What's a normal temperature? What's a normal heart rate? And then we take it to the next step. Well, what does it mean if something is not in that reference range? How do we get beyond that basic level and, and apply critical thinking skills? Problem solving is something that you're gonna see again and again. I think that that's what makes this curriculum so very rich. And that's so different than the world that I experienced when I was a veterinary student. Um, as a veterinary student, I spent honestly eight to 10 hours a day in lecture just being talked at. And what I love about the commitment that our administration has and our faculty do is that we wanna give you the ability to think for yourself, to critically think, to problem solve, to start as early as fall semester saying, okay, how do I take it to the next level? I know what to look for when I'm looking at my patient about respiratory rate. I know my pet's respiratory rate is high. What does that mean? How do I know what system or where in the, the respiratory tree that's coming from? And, and how do I intervene? What is the next appropriate step? And you're gonna to work together in teams. You're gonna to, to solve problems. You're gonna work through cases really early. I think that that'll give you a really uh, novel approach to thinking like a practitioner. There's no reason you have to wait until you uh, walk across the floor on graduation day, right? And get your diploma. We want to treat you as colleagues right from the start. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build skills onto knowledge base. These are a number of pictures from past classes that I've taught. And, and the backgrounds are gonna look different. Um, you're gonna have different teaching rooms, classrooms, outdoor experiences. But you can see some of the things we'll be working with. Um, we're gonna work with a lot of non-animal teaching models. Um, so a lot of our, our first skills and first efforts are going to be on silicone suture pads or um, fake uh, cephalic limb trainers to work on venipuncture. We're gonna work on live animals as well. And so um, you're gonna work on, on at least five different species. And then we're going to layer in opportunities as we grow in terms of exotics. But by the time you graduate, you'll feel really comfortable with cats, dogs, horses, sheep, and cattle. So it gives you really a nice mixed foundation. For many of you, a lot of these skills are going to be new and that's exciting. It's really cool to learn new things. I love seeing students exceed and excel, you know, test out waters, uh, spread their wings and fly. I think that's the best part of veterinary school. It's your time to soar and shine. Sometimes some of you bring a ton of extra stuff to the table. All of you actually do in different ways. And so depending on your past experiences, depending on your backgrounds, you have an enormous amount of, of learning potential and teaching potential. You can teach your peers a ton of things that you've, you've picked up along the way. And so sometimes there'll be topics that, that you're really savvy with, and that's great. I see that as a wonderful opportunity to be peer teachers. Um, so those of you with awesome sheep and cattle skills, you're gonna be the saviors of our group, right? You're gonna be those who the small animal people are gonna look to or vice versa. And there's so many opportunities for growth and, and, and that's what I love as a teacher. I learn from you as much as you learn from me. And so we're gonna work together. What's review for you may be new for someone else and that's okay. We're all gonna start in the same foundation and grow in that bond together. 
So that's clinical skills. Clinical skills is really about being in a, in a practical setting, doing things, hands-on, physical exams, uh, surger, surgical skills, those sorts of things. We've partnered that with a, a separate consecutive series of courses, and that's called professional skills. And, and just like clinical skills, it's gonna carry with you through sophomore surgery. So what does that mean, professional skills? Well, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, traditionally, these were viewed as the quote unquote soft skills. These were things that back when I was in vet school, we'd never really learned about. No one talked about how to write a soap note or medical documentation until you got to the clinics and then you needed to write one on day one, you weren't sure how, um, and it created a lot of stress for us. Um, we weren't taught how to communicate. We weren't taught how to interact with our clients. We were just kind of tossed into the exam room and we hoped for the best. Um, now we're realizing um, that, that we need to provide extra guidance. And what that means is we can start early by thinking about some of those uh, topics that are going to be stressors potentially for you. Um, how do we assess a patient's risk? How do we think about what diseases our patients can carry and what implications that might be for our staff or ourselves, or even our clients? You know, how does disease spread? Um, what about medical errors? Those happen too. How do we talk about them? Each one of us is going to create them. We're human, we're not perfect. Um, so how do we approach that situation? How do we navigate that? Uh, and, and a lot of these skills are really skills for life and that's why they're called professional skills. They're skills that aren't just specific to veterinary medicine, but we can tailor them to our journey um, and our career and, and hopefully have that help you. You'll see that there's also an emphasis on feedback. How do we deliver feedback and how do we receive it? And, and given the style of how our program's gonna work and how you're gonna have team-based learning, that becomes a really essential part of how do you grow together as a team and move forward past conflict and, and really create harmonious outcomes. This is just kind of a summary slide um, of all the things that we're gonna cover. Uh, the backdrop is, is me doing a simulated client uh, encounter. Um, and it's a reminder for me that we're gonna do those same experiences for you. And what does that look like? That means that from time to time, you'll be going down to HSIB, um, down on main campus, or if we are online, um, we'll be making opportunities through Zoom to interact with actors. Uh, and it's gonna look very similar in structure to how your MMIs looked. Um, so you'll be presented with a case or a clinical vignette or a situation, and then you're gonna be tasked with certain things. Um, in the fall, you're gonna have four opportunities to work with these actors. And it's gonna help you to grow. Um, the emphasis on these opportunities is not on necessarily how you perform in the moment. They're learning opportunities, they're training grounds, they're, they're areas that are safe and supportive. So that if you say something that you wish you hadn't said, right, or you wanna rewind the circumstance and try it again, those are the best opportunities to see, how could I try this out differently? If I said X, how might the patient or the client have responded? Um, we're gonna start with history taking in the fall, and then we're gonna build up to really difficult conversations. So that way, when they do occur to you in practice, you at least have felt like you've gotten your feet wet. So I just wanna say thank you for that opportunity to, to give you kind of a bird's eye view of our coursework. And it's with great pleasure that I hand the baton over to my colleague, Gail. Um, she's awesome, and, and you'll be seeing her a lot in our clinical and professional skills course. Thank you, Ryan. Um, nice to meet all of you. I'm, I'm excited for the day to meet you in person one day here. And so a little bit about myself. I grew up in California. Uh, obtained my bachelor's degree at Cal Poly and uh, was accepted to the University of Wisconsin for my master's degree in reproductive physiology and uh, then went to vet school at Madison and straight out of vet school in 1984 when I graduated I landed a internship position at Arizona Equine and after a year there, I was offered an associate position. And then 
1996, um, Dr. Scott Taylor and I were offered the opportunity to purchase the business, which was very exciting. Um, and once things went along pretty smoothly, I decided to try to learn some more and become more proficient with computers and whatnot because most of the time I wanted to be outside working with the horses. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I took an online course in learning with technology. And then while I was employed at Arizona Equine, I was able to also teach online at Ashford and I taught basic biology. And um, was very excited when I was offered uh, the opportunity to come and, and teach with uh, the CVM at the University of Arizona. At our practice in, in um, Gilbert, we do take many, many veterinary te technical students, very many, we have a lot of veterinary extern students that come and stay for periods of time, and we have anywhere from two to four interns that we take on that we spend a lot of time with so that they when they leave in a year's time they're either ready to go straight on to a residency or feel very comfortable going straight on to equine practice okay you could hang to the next slide and my passions and ryan's completely right when i went through veterinary school we were in classes eight hours in the information was just handed to us and we went and studied didn't have take any time really so it wasn't really until i was practicing for several years that i got back into riding my horses which many people when i was going through veterinary school told me oh gosh you can't be a, an equine vet and ride horses you'll be sick of them i said well you don't really know me so i still still ride in fact this morning i got up very early in road owen which is the gray horse that i'm jumping this morning and race back to the computer to see you guys okay you can go to the next slide and my other hobby that i love although i haven't done this as much is is painting and my hope is when i get organized every day i think i'm going to be organized get back into my drawing and painting and of course animals are my favorite okay you can go to the next one um, we also, I, my family and I like to travel and I, I was, we hosted an exchange student one year from China and then I was able to meet some students from Kansas uh, that Dr. Engler, Ryan also knows and they hung out with me for a week and were very interested in reproductive physiology. So when we went back to China in 2018 to tour, um, my daughter is right here. She's adopted from China, so we could do her homeland tour. Um, I was invited to speak for two days on reproductive physiology and help some of the veterinarians there. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So my, I'm going to be part-time down at U of A and, and part-time up here at my practice so that I can um, bring you current information and how an equine practitioner works on a daily basis so i've been with arizona equine and practicing for 32 years and i will be able to to hold both positions um, together so as as i'm i'm an ambulatory practitioner uh, so i i do a lot of reproduction a lot of dentistry which you can see up here a lot of times i will work at horse shows and events because they need veterinarians on the ground and i travel to people's homes and help them with their horses so i i'm going to be part of with ryan helping you to assess situations because many times if you all are going into a large animal situation you're going to need to think ahead which i'm going to help you with how can you work on this horse? Is it safe for you to work on this horse? Do you have somebody that's properly holding the horse for you? And that's my goal to share what I've learned over the years with you and make you, that you walk out the door and you can and do this. So I'll be helping Dr. Engler with 
clinical and professional skills. And many of you, as she said, will have the upper, have a lot of good background with large animals, but maybe a lot of you do not. So I wanna help you work safely around this animal or at least have that knowledge. So for example, I might ask you how, how you safely lead this horse, which of the situations is best? Um, and just for you that aren't comfortable or don't know, number C is the ideal situation. You're always working on the left side of the animal. You never wrap the rope around your hand. You've got one hand close and one further, and you always want to be at the shoulder. The other things I'm going to be helping with is medical microbiology, antimicrobial therapy, and medical math. Um, and here's an example here, which is useful in large and small. You'll be able to read a bottle. You'll be able to identify the dose and dosage and calculate what's the appropriate um, amount that you should be giving. Okay, you can just go to the next slide. So banamine calculations, everything's usually in kilograms. We're all familiar with pounds. Uh, we want to convert to kilograms. And then once we have that, then we look at what is our dose. And from that, we can figure out what our dosage is. And then we want to figure out what is actually the milliliters that we want to draw out. Um, one particular medication, banamine, is, should be given only in the, in the blood vessel. And so as with small animals, Dr. Engler is going to help you. I'm going to guide you through what blood vessels are easiest for you to access and how you should approach that. Okay, next slide. One of the other things I'm going to be helping you with is blood gas analysis. The body is has a particular pH. It should be balanced, not too acidic and not too basic. And when we have problems, diarrhea or um, vomiting in a small animal, their pH becomes out of whack. They become acidotic or alkalotic. And maybe initially, you will need to figure out what IV fluids you need to give to them to stabilize them before you proceed on. So in foundations, we're gonna start just scratching the surface of that and get you to feel comfortable with this. Okay, we could go to the next one. Uh, this is just another basic, which I'm sure a lot of you in your chemistry have had this. Um, I remember when I was in veterinary school, none of this was taught to me. I don't know about you, Ryan. And it was pretty much on the clinic floor and then pretty much when I got out into practice. And I want you to be more comfortable than I was. I want you to be better than I was. And that's my goal here. So, and as Ryan said, a lot of you have a background <clears throat> and come a lot to the table. And I want to learn from you as much as you want to learn from me. Okay, we can go to the next one. Another facet I'm going to be helping you with in, in foundations is medical microbiology and antimicrobial therapy. I want, you will become accomplished at saying, okay, I can identify that there is either a viral problem or a, mic a bacterial problem, and how do I attack this? How do I know what antibiotics should I use or should I even be using antibiotics? Can we manage this without? Because we all know there is a lot of resistance to some of the antibiotics we have. So we as veterinarians are stewards for antibiotics and we need to help our clients with that as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this last one was a horse with Streptococcus equi equi, which is a, a very contagious bacteria. And how do you go about diagnosing it? How do you go about taking a sample? What are the biosecurity issues? And, and you, when you guys are graduating, you will, as day ones, you will have a good grasp of that. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And, uh, that's the end of my presentation, and uh, 
now we're opening it up for any questions. Hey everybody, um, so if you want to ask a question, just put it into the chat. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so I'm hoping everybody can see the chat button. Um, if you can't, just turn your, um, do let us know so we can try and correct that. I have a question for you guys. Do anybody have any idea of what they would like to do? Or does anybody just are coming in saying, I'm very interested in everything? What what do you think most of you guys want to do small animal? Do you want to do research? Or no, no idea? And it's okay not to have an idea of what you want. I think that's great because then you're not limiting yourself to what you want to do. Okay, so I've got some questions coming in now. So let's see. So we've got one. Um, oh gosh, let me just scroll back up here. So we had one that was concerning locations and where the classes will be held. Um, and we have made a proposal to the provost office. We're just um, like uh, Dr. Tanisha Price Johnson said. We should have um, more information on that, hopefully by, by July 1st. But we will, in general, have court classes both at our Oro Valley campus and also at the Campus Agricultural Center. So you will be most likely in at least those two places and perhaps also HSIB, which is where um, you guys did the MMI in the spring. I've just got a couple of responses um, to uh, Gail's question. Let's see. We've got someone saying they'd love to do equine and small animal surgery. Looking forward to learning from both of you guys. Um, hey. Yeah. Some people are open to just lots of other areas, and that's probably a good thing. I have a good friend who's a veterinary ophthalmologist, and he thought he was going to go into equine when he started his career, but um, he does more small animal stuff now. So you just never know what's going to hit your interest while you're in veterinary school. Let's see, I've got someone saying small animal ER and critical care. Ooh, that's a, that's an intense one. Yeah, let's see. Um, there's a question on orientation and um, we will have more details on that fairly soon. That's something that we're still working out. Um, there likely will be some sort of mix of online and in-person components. Okay, this is a great question. Um, I might turn this over to faculty. Will there be classes within professional skills addressing biases and cultural differences, such as how to assist with clients that come from cultures that don't allow euthanasia, for example? Yeah, that's actually an incredible question. And we are going to infuse um, that really as a theme throughout all of professional skills. So we're gonna work very closely with uh, Teresa, she's our Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, and she's going to introduce some of these themes and orientation as the plan, but then we're going to build on them. And so uh, we're going to start as early as the first six weeks of class, just talking about what are biases, you know, what are our own biases, um, how do 
things that we think and feel or observe or think we observe and assume uh, impact our relationships with clients and and how can we work and grow because we all have those um, we're all different we all see things differently and so yes we will build up to that and second year will be probably the optimal time for those difficult conversations and challenges once we've gotten our feet wet first year we'll start to think about how do we problem solve and come up with strategies that that can make us um, better able to work with clients um, and, and differences in belief, culture, culture systems, religion. Um, I've worked certainly in practices where, where I had to troubleshoot some of those things and, and I found that those were my best times to grow as an individual. So we'll work with you and, and also invite you to share in class for those who want to your own experiences and what that has looked like. Awesome, thank you. Another really cool question that came in, um, will we have an opportunity to work with any camelids at some point? Ooh, that's a great point. Um, I'm hopeful, yes. Um, I've not been able to um, go on site yet, and, and I apologize, I'm, I'm new to the area. I arrived and then with COVID, I wasn't able to explore, but Louise King is one of our anatomists, and, and she is making arrangements for me to go uh, with her to to a place that's like a wildlife refuge and other refuge where they actually have a lot of hoof stuff and so i need to make connections and the hope is that we could create some partnership opportunities i just probably can't get there until i'd say the end of july there's a lot of places that are still kind of closed or or you know limiting foot traffic Oh, here's another one. This will be an interesting one. Um, can one of you faculty um, explain how you plan to use the required textbooks in classes? Um, I'm trying to figure out if I want to buy a hard copy or if the online access will be okay. Why don't we share? Gail, do you want to start by talking about textbooks in, in your aspect and then I'll add one for sure. For sure. Um, so we have Dr. Sally Anslax has created a lovely list of open access books that you, you all can do. There are a handful of required ones that they want you to purchase, I believe maybe five. So it, I think for me, it's your personal preference. I'm somebody that likes to have the book in my hand, but I realize those are very, they're very expensive to have all the books you want. So maybe a good choice is to, as we move through classes, because we're gonna have links for you to go to the books. And if you find that you really enjoy a book and you want it for future reference, then that might be one you might wanna consider buying later on. So it's a great way to sample and see what you have there. But I think there's about five that are wanted, they want you to require, or wanted to be required to, per, to purchase. Okay, Ryan, you go ahead. Yeah, I would agree with Gail there. Um, I think what's really exciting about the University of Arizona's library system is it's honestly larger than any other school that I've experienced. And I include Cornell in that and Kansas and Midwestern. And so what's great is the online access to many of our books that we'll be using repeatedly throughout the curriculum is unlimited. And what is good about it is it means that if all of you decide on the same day and the same hour to open up this textbook, you all can have access to it, right? Whereas sometimes libraries have uh, limited access where three of you get to look at it, but then everyone else is shut out for a while. And so that really is protective for you. We're trying to keep the costs down um, and the quality is really good. So for example, the physical exam textbook of mine, that has about, about a thousand color photos. Those photos come across just as nice digitally as in person. Um, I really wanted to create um, resources for you that don't require you to, to shell out money. Um, in all transparency, I make about a dollar per textbook sale. So I really am not trying to, to push, push books. It's my latte money at best. So I really did it for the love of education. But um, if you find there's something that you really love, um, then, then that's what I tried to use as my guideline for when to purchase something. Um, so um, if you find, wow, I, I really love, for example, physiology, 
and, and you're like, this really intrigues me. I, I like that. That might be one you want to hold in your hands and make notes in and highlight. Um, so it really is personal preference. And if you find that certain of you buy certain textbooks, you can also look and see what each other has and lean on that as references. Awesome, thank you. Um, there is another question about daily schedules um, and whether that's tied into the July 1st decision. So to some degree, um, we anticipate that you will be you know, in class between 8.30 and 4.30, more of a typical work day, not necessarily that whole time. Um, but if you're at Campbell Farms, you may be required to be there a little earlier, earlier at seven o'clock. And that's just because of, of the heat, you know, the first couple of months of the school year, it'll still be really warm here. Um, so it's best to get up and do things early. Um, and from personal experience, if you're the kind of person, if you're more of a late kind of person, sort of a night owl, you might want to start working your way back into more of a normal schedule because uh, with the desert heat, it's oftentimes better to, you know, get up at, at dawn and get things done um, in the earlier part of the day. Let's see, looking at some more questions here. We talked about textbooks. So this is a good one. Um, in professional skills courses, will we learn about personal finances? Um, not only with student debt, but also some basic financial management for opening a practice or starting your own business. Absolutely. So that's a big thread, and, and I was negligent at not bringing that up during my PowerPoint. But yes, we'll start. I want to say in October and November, there will actually be several sessions on finance. Um, we'll start off with kind of a, a personal finance type situation. Um, and we're working with Jim, um, one of our, our uh, associate clinical um, faculty members. And so um, he has a lot of savvy with, with management of clinical practices. And we're working on a, a really neat assignment that will actually let you create almost like a personal budget, but for you to help you grow through vet school. And then we're gonna use that to help facilitate other types of financial discussions. So. Um, we're going to have discussions that tie in with clinical pathology during the fall of, for example, why do we choose to send blood work out? What are the costs of sending blood work out to an outside lab versus buying in-house equipment? How do you do that cost analysis? Um, we're going to kind of repeat that theme in uh, year one um, spring, or, or I'm sorry, summer, where we start to think about gastrointestinal disease. When do we do radiographs? When do we use ultrasound? Do we hire someone in as a mobile ultrasonographer in small animal? Do we um, actually send to an internist? All of those discussions, you know, to help you decide what to do. So there'll be a lot of practice management opportunities um, and potential opportunities to form uh, student organizations or chapters, um, like with the, the veterinary business leaders and those sorts of things. Awesome, thank you. So we've got another question about um, kind of the, the, the day, if you will, and if um, students will be moving from place to place during school hours. Um, and my understanding could be outdated on that. So maybe, I don't know, Leanne, can you step into that for that one? Yeah, so will there so be a need, for example, to go from Oro Valley to CAC and then back maybe in one day? Yep, right now we are looking at having you guys primarily stay um, at one site for the entire day or like for the duration of your courses. Um, there is a possibility that right now just looking at fall, there may be one day where you could be in Oro Valley and then you could be moving to Campbell at the same time. But other than that, we really have tried hard to keep it where you are at the just the one site um, and throughout the whole schedule. And our hope is throughout your whole two years is to try to make it so that you're not bouncing back and forth. That keeps you guys a little bit safer as well. Um, we've got another question about plans for uh, some sort of shuttle between Oro Valley and Main Campus. Um, Katie, do you have an update on that one for us? If she's still on the line. No, she may not be. 
Um, so we'll need to get back to you on that one. I, last I knew that was still in uh, part of conversation. I don't know if anybody else has an update on that one. I'm hearing some odd feedback. I don't know if someone's trying to ask, if someone's trying to speak. No, we all look good. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is a good question. Um, I have a question for the small animal clinical skills. Is there going to be a block for small animal dentals? Great question. We're working on probably pairing that with the sophomore surgery exercises. So um, at this point, we're gonna introduce dental in year one summer but that's more akin to physical exam, oral exam, um, opening the mouth, you know, naming the dentition, numbering the dentition, what can go wrong with the dentition. And then, yes, my understanding is that the surgical faculty as we move forward with the shelter spays and neuters um, are going to try to buddy up and partner in dentistry because for sure um, it is an AVMA requirement um, and it is for accreditation as well. And so, we, we wanna get you a lot more information than I did when I graduated. Um, when I graduated, most schools gave you about zero dentistry. I think I had one lecture on it. And then there was an elective rotation. Um, and I remember all we saw were German shepherd dogs um, that were getting root canals because they were used in um, the military. And so they were all having fancy dental work. But I never learned how to extract a tooth, right? And then you go into private practice and that's a lot of what you do. And so we want you to be in, in a better setting. So we will expose you to that. But my guess is, gonna, is that it will take place during your, your surgical exercises where you get hands on with actual live animals. Thank you so much. Let's see. Um, another question came up about parking passes. Um, no, there shouldn't be a need to purchase a, a main campus parking pass. Um, you don't need parking passes at all for the Oro Valley, Valley location. Um, and then you, if you need to use paid, utilize paid parking when you're closer to main campus, um, you can just use one of the garages and maybe carpool with a couple people um, and split, split the amount if you need to do that. Um, I don't believe at CAC there it's also free parking. So for the most part, that shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, definitely don't, don't buy uh, a parking pass. Reading through some more questions here. Hmm, this is a very specific one. Um, will there be an opportunity to work with the Tucson Bee Research Center regarding bee health and pollinators? You know, I don't know. I was going to say, I don't know specifically that organization, but my gut feel would be 99.99% yes, because Dr. Fox, uh, Cynthia Fox, our awesome anatomist is beekeeper extraordinaire. In mm -hmm. fact, he just uh, finished a textbook um, that is in preprint on honeybee medicine. And so literally the first two months of my work here, she was out working with facilities in Arizona um, to take pictures and stuff. So Gail, I don't know if you know that specific organization, but. No, I don't know it, but I know Cynthia, that field of study is near and dear to her heart. So I'm sure I bet you that she could make that happen. That's my guess. Awesome. Um, we've got a question. Um, let's see, it's about the clinical sites in the third year. Um, I don't know whether Dr. Lath or Dr. Engler, how much involvement you've had in those conversations. Um, but the question is, will the clinical sites we visit during our third year provide ample opportunity to practice the clinical skills that we learned during years one and two? And can you elaborate on how those clinical sites will facilitate the learning that takes place in year one and two? That's a great question. I can give you the brief overview at this time because a lot of those decisions are not in my wheelhouse. Um, I'm privy to some of the conversations, but not all. Um, the real big plus, here um, is that um, I'm working with Don and Tina, and they are our clinical 
correlates essentially. There are leaders that will guide you from the preclinical curriculum into those sites. And so their whole responsibility right now, and they've both been hired their full time, is, is reaching out, making those connections, getting those sites up to speed, developing rubrics for training, for uh, assessing, um, so that these faculty members at those sites understand what your curriculum is. So that essentially we don't want to just take you at your you know, point of growth maximally after your second year and just dump you into a clinic. That doesn't help you, right? It doesn't help um, bridge the gap between your learning style, how we taught you, and then the clinic. And so we really want to have training wheels for that. And, and what that looks like is bringing those on-site faculty in on our discussions earlier. And so those discussions are already happening. Those connections are being made um, so that no one will be blind in terms of going into something where they don't know what you've learned. Um, the hope is there'll be transparency, open door dialogue. Um, what that officially looks like, honestly, that's beyond my, my ability to share because I don't make those decisions, but I work very closely with those individuals so that there's great alignment between our core values, how you're taught, and making sure you actually can go to those sites and not just be a slave to the pharmacy, right, and just filling scripts all day long, right, and not just shadowing, but actually doing. Um, and so really we're looking for sites that are invested in active learning, that want you there, right, that don't see you as just somebody for free labor, that really see you as a part of the team, um, and many of these sites, you may actually develop long lasting relationships. You may decide, hey, this is a place I want to work at. So it, it really, we're, we're wanting to make it the most beneficial possible. And there'll be lots of checks and balances. You'll be able to give us feedback on how a site is doing um, at, in the moment, right? And that way we can adjust and adapt if we need to. Does that help, hopefully? Thank you very much. Um, yes, that was super helpful. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, will there be a focus on Arizona? Uh, for example, will we learn about diseases most commonly encountered in Arizona or also learn about diseases specific to other regions in the U.S.? Absolutely. So we'll cover uh, valley fever for sure. So when I was a vet student at Cornell, I don't think I ever learned about valley fever. Maybe maybe one sentence in a thousand page textbook reading that I had to do in like eight hours or something. <laughs> but um, I really didn't learn about that. Um, I really didn't learn about leptospirosis, right? And then I got into practice and there were all sorts of lepto cases in Baltimore City. So yes, our goal is to give you one, a broad overview. We want you to be successful because maybe you won't work in Arizona. Maybe you're gonna work in a different part of the world. So we need to, to get you kind of the familiar regional diseases but then yes, we'll dive down into what does things, what do things look like from the ground up? So we'll cover rattlesnakes. We were just having a faculty meeting about rattlesnake envenomation. What does that look like? And that of course is a big thing here. Um, and rattlesnake training for dogs, for rattlesnake avoidance is big here. So a lot of clients will ask about that. Rattlesnake vaccines, are they good, are they bad? Why do we use them? Um, and valley fever. So, Gail, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Uh, yes, one of the big things, we have a lot of externs that come and we encounter a lot of Habernomiasis, which is a parasite that lives in the stomach and the larvae are passed out. Flies walk on the manure and take the larvae and put it in the corner of the eye on the end of the penis or create another wound or even on the corner of the mouth and the students said oh they told us this isn't around anymore in arizona and horses it's pretty significant so i would love to share with you and we do see rattlesnake bites frequently in horses we do see valley fever in horses although uncommonly so and we do heat see heat stress and uh, i will share everything i know in regards to Arizona for you. Thank you. Um, another question came up. Will we learn about biosecurity practices in depth? 
Yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start off very superficial because we just need to kind of start with the definition. What is it? Um, but then, of course, how do we define it? How do we use it in small animal as well as large animal? And then also as early as fall, thinking about how have the recent current events changed our understanding of biosafety? Um, the world looked a lot different uh, to all of us before, you know, 2020. Um, veterinary practice as we know it has changed and, and what kinds of things we do in practice. Gail lives this every day that she's out in practice, so she could share a whole bunch of stories with you. Yeah, yeah so just managing and creating biosecurity on a farm, absolutely. How, how, what's practical? What's reasonable? How you talk to your clients? Biosecurity on my truck, um, how do I do that and go from farm to farm? What do I carry with me to help with that? Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we've got one more question about um, will there be any opportunities to work with BLM wild horses? Ooh. Oh, I thought Gail got Mark excited to answer that. <laughs> and then I think she got frozen for a second. Uh, I did. I think, doesn't Dr. King do a lot with the burrows um, yes. that are BLM, BLM burrows? Um, I believe with a particular population. Yep. I personally don't work with them much, although some client horses act about that wild. So <laughs> I think Dr. King has some information on that. I mean, she's not here with us today, but she does quite a bit with that. Okay, so you can always email um, Dr. King and, and get a response if you want to. Uh, further pursue that, that question. Okay, um, well, we're almost out of time. I've got maybe time for one more question. Um, do you remember that, you know, if there's anything that, you know, didn't get answered, um, feel free to, you know, email DVM admissions or you're free to email a faculty. Um, we'll do the best we can to respond to specific questions. Um, acknowledging that some things are still a little bit up in the air given the current situation. Um, let's see. Well, this is interesting. Um, have either Dr. Inglar or Dr. Lath ever had to do international collaborations for research or to figure out a case? Ooh, I did get to help uh, my friend from China that uh, Dr. Jing Li, he had documented the first ever herda case in a horse. So he was the young man that came for a week and then he asked me to help him with his article to just review grammar and whatnot. So I think there is. Just yeah, I, I would thought. agree. I do a lot of um, international collaborations, not so much in doing the research, but um, helping each other uh, create manuscripts that are acceptable for different magazines. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, what's great about vet medicine is it's a really small world. Every journal has their own requirements. And so those of us who are good at publishing in a certain journal um, can help others uh, in terms of just structure of how to write. Um, I, have, I have connections with Egypt and connections with China, uh, France, Spain, and Chile. And so I see a lot of papers that they're working on, and most of that is in the realm of clinical skills. So that's super exciting. It's not research as you would call it, like benchtop research, um, but a good example would be, I've been working with um, Brazil uh, because they established a, a prostate model for canine rectal palpation. And so I had some questions about how we might build that because they had, had printed like an abstract in, in the journal of vet med education. And they sent me their entire thick publication and it was all in Portuguese, but they had these diagrams that were awesome. And so it's such a small community um, on ResearchGate. There's a lot of conversations and, and potential for collaboration um, as well as also just nationally. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be working with um, some organizations to try to build some olfactory um, clinical skills type things to incorporate in your second year lab. 
Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to wrap things up for today. There is another, our third and I believe final Faculty Friday scheduled for July 31st. So we will for sure communicate out to you guys about that. Um, and again, if there are any other questions, you know, things are more student affairs related um, or related to, um, you can send those, you know, to me and Lori through DDM admissions. Um, but hope you guys have an awesome day and an awesome weekend. Thank you for attending. And uh, we will also let you know um, once that the recording is available for you to, to review. Um, and for those who didn't attend, they'll have that opportunity as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, appreciate everybody's time and attention today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. have a great day.